Uh, my name is Ryan Montcamp, uh, and I'm giving a talk entitled Service Oriented Design and Practice. Uh, hopefully, a good complement to the uh, material that Chris just presented very well. So, tough act to follow. Um, like I said, uh, this is how you, you can get a hold of me um, at Ryan Area on Twitter. And I work at a company called Efficiency 2.0. Uh, and a lot of this talk is going to share some of the experiences we've had over the, the last year or so in implementing and perhaps uh, more interestingly uh, maintaining a service oriented design through the course of building our application. Uh, briefly what our application does is it pulls in a bunch of data about how people use energy and it makes targeted recommendations for how a given homeowner might best uh, release their energy use. So the name of the talk had uh, service oriented design in it, the name of Chris talks, uh, Chris's talk had the name service oriented architecture, what is uh, service oriented design, uh, Paul Dix wrote a book, Service Oriented Design with Ruby on Rails. And in the book, he had this quote, uh, which, which I really liked. Um, he says, Service Oriented Architecture has become a loaded term. To many, it implies the use of tools such as SOAP, WSDL, WS Star, or XML RPC. This is why we use the word design as opposed to architecture. So, this isn't a paradigm shift here. Uh, Paul was just trying to free up the concept of service orientation from the baggage of these enterprise protocols and legacy technologies give people a fresh approach to it and, and reconsider it for their problem domains. So what's the point of this talk? We just saw a talk about services, why a second one. It all comes down to this. Uh, this is a quote uh, by a guy, Louis Brandy. Uh, he wrote this on his blog about a year ago, and I remember reading it, and it stuck with me. He says, never trust a programmer who says you know C++. Um, and I know this is hard to read, uh, best I can do, but I'll sort of walk you through it. The, the graph is of a programmer's confidence, uh, self-confidence in C++ over time. So in the upper left, uh, the programmer has decided that they know C++, uh, that C++ is just like C with classes, which is awesome because everyone knows objects are awesome, and they have sort of conquered C++ and they're going to use it for everything. And then a funny thing starts to happen. Uh, the programmer starts running some, some issues with C++. Uh, template error messages are pretty confusing. Reference types might be a bit too magical, they find. Uh, WTF is a virtual deconstructor. I don't actually know. Uh, the exception specifiers are worse than Java's. Static object initialization seg faults. Uh, and then finally, the programmer hits rock bottom in the, uh, the trough in the middle of the graph. And he says, we need some rules. Uh, and through thinking about uh, some rules that he can apply to his, his use of C++, he's able to regain his confidence in C++ and actually use it without running into so many of his problems. So the thesis that I'm presenting here today is that service-oriented design, like C++, and I believe like many other difficult programming concepts, is a two-peat concept. Um, so this talk will sort of walk through my trajectory in thinking about service orientation uh, over the past couple of years, uh, both at Efficiency 2.0, before that I was at Guild, which uses a lot of services. Uh, so I reached a point where, uh, kind of like Chris alluded to, service-oriented design is going to be the solution to everything. Uh, it's like object-oriented programming, the single responsibility principle applied at the system level, will encapsulate everything. Uh, you, know, you can read blog posts out there about Amazon. Uh, I think they're, they're the most prime example of this. And everyone has heard that Amazon uses, I don't know, it's 50, 100 services uh, to, to just render their single home page. Uh, so you think about that, and you can, uh, you know, I, I thought that every one of our problems could be clearly defined into a, a nice set of services that are all going to coordinate and communicate together very, uh, you know, in a very structured form. And that would solve a lot of the problems that maintaining large Rails apps uh, uh, might present. And it can solve those problems. Um, but we also ran into some issues along the way. So, descending down the curve, uh, we ran into issues like our designer can't move the app anymore because the script server doesn't work. Uh, we just copy and paste all of our deploy scripts. We've got this bug, and we don't really know where it is. It's not just one data store and, it's, and one set of code, it's you know, three data stores and three sets of code. Uh, our tests are green, but production just broke. What happened there? Uh, and now, you know, we have tests that will fail if there's a bug, but they're such a pain to run. Nobody really runs them locally, it's just on CI, CI is getting redder and redder, uh, and that was a big problem for us. So, a little bit of background about our particular uh, use case, uh, Efficiency 2.0, uh, team size is about five guys, um, the 
the code has been around for in various forms for uh, between maybe one or two years now. Uh, and this is kind of what it looked like when I dropped in about a year ago from now. Uh, we had a front-end user-facing application, that's pretty standard, and then we had three services supporting that, uh, connected in some cases with RabbitMQ. We had a bill collector that pulls in a bunch of data from our clients who are actually uh, electric utilities. Uh, we had a calculator, which is this really uh, crazy energy science algorithm store that churns on all the data, and we had this weather service which takes in hourly weather data from a few different sources and smooths it all out, uh, makes it very readily accessible to the, uh, to the calculator, as you can see. So, what does our architecture look like now, about a year later? Uh, we've simplified things, generally. Uh, we still use services, and we're very happy with the services that we're using, but uh, the bill collector, as you can see, is gone. We folded that up into the uh, user-facing application when we reevaluated some of our core assumptions around it. And, you know, we still have the calculator, still have weather, We've been reducing the number of dependencies between services, though, trying to get uh, one-way dependencies instead of uh, cyclic dependencies. We've gotten rid of RabbitMQ entirely. In the end, we found uh, RabbitMQ was a very good tool for what it was intended for, but it was a little bit more than we needed. And sometimes not, uh, you know, we just needed more visibility where RabbitMQ was providing more speed. So we optimized for what we needed for now. We might return to RabbitMQ uh, as our scalability needs and performance needs increase, but for now we're uh, we're going with something a little bit simpler. So, what sort of benefits can you get from a service oriented design? This is a lot of the stuff that Chris uh, touched on, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. First off, uh, there's isolation. So, this is one of the, the core benefits of services, and all the other benefits kind of in some way flow from this. Um, but just like you might expect, uh, using a service oriented design, you can take components of your application, break them down, break down their data needs, break down their tests into smaller units, and as we all know, smaller units are generally, by default, easier to maintain uh, in programming, uh, unless uh, there are sort of other factors that, are, that might make them more difficult. Um, robustness, uh, so this is kind of like the encapsulation principle. Uh, if you had a well-defined API, it's probably HTTP, REST, JSON, all those good things, if you're a Ruby programmer that you like, um, you can change out anything that's going on under the hood without having to modify any of the clients. So in that way, your service-oriented design might be uh, considered robust to change. Uh, scalability, uh, you can optimize different sections of your application for different operational characteristics. For example, write-heavy uh, data storage versus read-heavy data storage. You could use two different data stores wrapped all up over HTTP. Uh, agility is kind of an interesting one. A lot of people don't think about service-oriented architecture as being a uh, something that increases your agility. They it's tend to think, uh, most people think it sort of goes the other way. But there are some interesting ways where it can increase your agility. For example, uh, in maintaining our services, we wanted to start looking at upgrading our Ruby VMs to Ruby 1.9. We're able to do that on a smaller increments, and that allows us to get some code out of Ruby 1.9 faster, and probably get the entire transition out faster because it's not so daunting. So in that way, it allows us to be more agile. Uh, interoperability, taking di disparate systems and connecting them together. Uh, Twitter's a good example. They have a bunch of scale services that provide HTTP uh, endpoints that the Ruby code uses. You can speak a common language. And then reuse. Um, so just that you can take a service, and maybe you've got a public API, you can start using that internally, or vice versa. Uh, but you've got a component, you can start thinking about how you can apply it to other problems. So why did we use services originally? Uh, we were looking for reuse, we were looking for uh, isolation, and generally we just wanted smaller components to be able to deal with. But the rest of this talk is primarily about everything after the, the tip of the curve. Uh, so I talked about briefly about five problems we ran into earlier. I want to share these problems with you, sort of describe uh, how they manifested themselves to us, what we did about them, and hopefully, if you're maintaining a service-oriented design now, uh, this can provide some, some tips on ways that you might be able to make uh, your, your day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance of that system better. And if you're not maintaining a service-oriented design, uh, one of my goals is to try to sort of give you a, a whole other set of considerations, which might be a little less obvious, to weigh in your decision of whether or not you want to apply these concepts. So, I, I listed off the five problems before. They really span four different areas. Uh, these are kind of bread and butter areas for any application that's being maintained. You've got local development, you've got deployment, uh, operations, what's happening once that code goes out to the server and it starts processing requests in production, and testing. 
So the first problem we ran into as soon as we introduced our first service is that our designer couldn't run the app anymore. Uh, so we have a guy who, who has this way around a Rails repository. Uh, he writes Haml and SAS uh, for us in addition to being awesome at Photoshop, that sort of thing. But with services, suddenly seeding into a directory and running script server doesn't work. I mean, it's a very quick way to get a, a very nice looking 500 page, but it wasn't going to cut it. Uh, and so long as our designer couldn't move the app, that meant we had to fix all the, uh, you know, the IE incompatibilities that he would otherwise just take care of for us. So this is a problem that needs to be solved immediately. Um, <laughs> so, so what did we do? Uh, we, we created a single command loop. Uh, we have a, an E2O command, and it has subcommands. So E2O start uh, will boot up the Efficiency 2.0 app. Uh, the whole idea here is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's no matter what you need to do to be able to start the app at this point, do it and just open the, the app working in uh, my local browser. That means cloning repositories, running Bundler, running migrations, booting uh, unicorn processes in the proper order. All that is encapsulated here. And if this thing doesn't give you a working app, then it's broken and you fix it. So we put that into a package called Echo CLI. This is a private gem that we maintain. It's hosted on our private Ruby gem server. And here's a sampling of the, the subcommands that it has. Um, each of a start is, is pretty obvious stop. Uh, a couple more interesting ones, or, or one particular more interesting one, is each of inventory. Uh, this is one I added one day, which I really like. And if I run each of inventory across all of our repositories, it will list out all of the code which hasn't been pushed into master, but hasn't been deployed to production. So even something as simple as saying, well, what have we worked on that we haven't actually shipped yet, gets a lot more harder with the service render architecture, because you have to do that n times. And doing things O of n is a lot uh, less efficient than doing things O of 1. So we built it on Thor. Uh, I shamelessly ripped code from the engineer CLI and the Rogue CLI to make this work. Uh, we really get going in about a day, and then we've been adding to it since. So that's one problem that we faced, and that's how we addressed it. Second problem we ran into is that we just copied and pasted all of our deploy code. So, Nobody likes maintaining deploy code. Nobody tests deploy code. It just sort of starts to accumulate like a lint ball underneath your, your couch. Uh, and then when you add your first service, the first thing you need to do is basically cp-r that config deploy directory into your, your new application. And that's bad, but it's not actually the worst part of that. Uh, the worst part is that now they're going to start to diverge in very subtle and potentially uh, destructive ways. So, Cap, uh, you know, restart might do something over here in this directory, but it might do something subtly different over here. And that can be a big problem when you're looking at the, the parts of your code base that actually are going to make changes on your running servers. So, what do we do about this? Uh, we package our deploy scripts into a gem. So, we have another private Ruby gem. It's called E2O Cap. Uh, here's a directory listing. And you can see it's nothing special. We put everything in E2O subdirectory. It's got a recipes directory under there. And then for each sort of concern we deal with, uh, in deployment, we have a Ruby file that we use. So this is very similar to like the EY cap gem, which many people are familiar with. You can do this for yourself if you have multiple applications you need to maintain and you want to get your deploy scripts just right. So the nice thing about this is by abstracting away all of the logic, which is customized for us, it's exactly how we want it, efficiency 2.0, not just our web host. Um, but now in our cap file, uh, this is an entire cap file for one of our services. So we just uh, use the, the old-fashioned gem command to require the gem. And right now we're using uh, version 0.10. We loaded the recipes, and then we just declaratively lay out what is special about this specific application uh, as it relates to the other applications that we need to deploy. So, for example, the Hoptoad API key is different per application, so that when errors get reported to Hoptoad, they get aggregated into the correct project. So that's a configuration variable. When we find that something needs to differ across uh, different projects, we create a configuration variable and bump the job. So, into some problems that have a little bit more meat on them. Uh, what's causing this bug? Uh, you've got some, you know, we've run across some screen, it's not showing the right number. There's a lot of different places that that issue could be coming from different data stores, different uh, code bases. Eventually, we decided we needed some more introspection into what's going on in production to be able to see what's going on. So, uh, we created a gem. This gem is actually public. It's up on GitHub. It's on Ruby Gems. It's called E2O Ops Middleware. And it does a few things which we found very useful in maintaining our service oriented architecture. So if you run a curl to one of our services, this is our calculator service and staging, uh, we're getting it through the load balancer. It adds a few headers here which are kind of interesting. First, it stamps everything with a transaction ID. This is basically just a quit. 
Uh, it's not useful in and of itself, but it's useful when you start to look at it in the perspective of the whole system, which we'll see in a second. Also, we have, we have a serve by header, so this gives the host name uh, in case there's something that might be misconfigured on one host and we've got the response. Uh, we don't have to go through fishing around trying to recreate it by checking each server one by one, you know exactly which server was generated by. And third, uh, and this is a really useful tip, I think, uh, we put a revision header in every response. It's easy, uh, we cache it as a, a class variable, so it doesn't have to you know, be looked up on disk every time, it doesn't slow things down. But it's really useful when you just ran a request and you're trying to figure out, wait, did that deploy finish as that was running, or was it the, you know, the old code? I'm not really sure. This will always be right. Um, like I said, it's open source, and everyone's welcome to use it. Fork it, uh, report bugs, pull requests, all that good stuff. Um, so the other side of the point is, when we're using our services, we want it more detailed logging. So this is a condensed version of a single request uh, that is processed through our front-end facing application. Uh, so you can see the, the user does a get for a specific page, and then we, there's some lines in here which are not uh, normal for a typical browser application that I'm going to kind of walk through. The first is the transaction ID. So that was the same transaction ID that goes into the header, the X transaction ID header. Uh, it also gets logged in the log in both the services or in the, the application, whichever, uh, whichever code base service that request is reported in that log. And then it gets a little more interesting. For every request we make to services, we actually log information about the request and the response. So generally, we don't have our logging turned up enough to where we log, look at every DB query, because there's a lot more of them. But for services, we found it important enough that we actually do want to record every request and response. So you can see the HTTP method, the URL, and then this is the response. Uh, and what we do is we record the HTTP status code that came back. So if that's not 200, I'm already going to be a little anxious. Uh, the server it came back from, in case that might have uh, an impact on the response we saw. The revision, uh, in case this is what we're looking at, we want to know what code served that up, even after we've deployed other code since then. And then, this is a little bit tricky, but we record the transaction ID that was generated by the service. So if the calculator included a transa transaction header that says it was transaction ABC, that's what's recorded here. And then the transaction ID you saw, at the, on the second line is actually the transaction of the user facing request. So it's essentially a tree structure where one request can generate other requests, but by keeping these cross references, if I'm going to go say, uh, look now in the calculator logs and say what happened when that request ran, I'm just going to copy and paste this transaction ID that's highlighted and grep the calculator production log on the App Store 2 server to find the, the output for that. So, the next problem is a pretty big one, uh, and what we found was by moving to services, we had more code bases, they each had their own test suites, but every once in a while, we would have a bug in production and our tests would be green. And we care a lot about the way we're testing things. Generally, whenever we see, uh, we feel like we have a bug, but we don't have a failing test, we view that as a failure in our testing approach or, or our test suites themselves. So we try to uh, dive into that and look at what's going on. So what would happen? Um, a simplified diagram of uh, you know, a call to a service, you have an application, you have a client, which is maybe just some classes in the middle, active resource could be a client, uh, it just knows how to make HTTP calls to your service, and the interface is great. The arrows, something uh, you know, associated with those arrows in the middle would stop working. So we thought a lot about what we could do about this. Um, there are some obvious solutions. One is to do all of your testing through the entire stack, right? You can boot everything up, uh, just like you do on a staging server. You can make requests to it with uh, Selenium, and you can test every piece of your app's functionality like that, and be sure that it all works together. That, that is an option. Uh, it has drawbacks, um, but, it, but it does work. Uh, we took a little bit different tact, uh, where we tried to sort of layer testing together in order to give us confidence without uh, giving us such a, a large uh, hit on our maintenance. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. The first thing we did was we made sure that we're versioning the client with the service. So this is the, the tree of our, our weather service. You can see at the top level we have a client directory and it's just laid out like a gem. Uh, this was really important because for a while we had one client which was not versioned with the service it was used for, and it required us to make changes to two repositories which had to be kind of synced up uh, to, to make sure that everything worked together. So moving things in, it's one less repository, and you can make the change to the, the server and the client in the same commit. It makes it a lot easier to read history. 
So the first thing we do is we test the client with the service. So back to that diagram, you can sort of just draw a big circle around the right side of it. Uh, and we're going to uh, make requests from the client to the server, make sure that the responses are what we expect. So how many of you have heard of Artifist? A few? OK. Artifist is really cool. Uh, it's kind of a little bit mind-bending when you first think about it. But what Artifist does, it's a, a library by Yehuda Katz. It's pretty simple. It's about like 70 lines. Uh, but they're Yehuda Katz lines of code, so that's like 700 lines of mortal programmer code. Uh, so it actually, when you call activate with, it replaces the net HTTP constant with a totally different thing. Um, and what it does is it takes calls to net HTTP, it serializes them down into rack calls, and it sends them to whatever you pass to do activate with. In this case, I am activating Artifice to replace all calls to net HTTP with the Rails application itself, so that it happens in the same thread, uh, kind of like a loopback connection. But what that means is we don't have to boot any extra process to test the client with HTTP effectively against the service itself. So that, that, that's pretty cool. It's worth checking out if you do anything like this. Um, but we just put some records in the database. We calculate our user is the client class. Uh, we instantiate one of those, and we check that it has an association that has three bills that come out the other side. So that's testing the client with the server. We test the app, or it could be another service, but whatever it needs to depend on the service uh, with test doubles. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, we're only testing at this point the left side. Uh, and we might have a test on our application side where we need some information, say electricity usage from our service. Uh, and we just use a simple RSpec mock like that. It's, it, there's nothing special about that. Um, so at this point, we've tested sort of the app, we've tested the other side, but the whole thing could still break. So then we add on to that testing the full stack. We draw a circle around the whole chart. We might use Cucumber for this. Uh, we would say that, you know, given this, uh, we're going to make a call to the service, view it through the end-facing, user-facing application, and then we get the right results back. So this does actually run with booted processes and make the calls all the way down. Putting it all together, if you can kind of see that, uh, it's like, I think of testing all these Venn diagrams. And uh, by adding that layer across the top, you start uh, sort of the larger testing unit, you start to get a lot more confidence without needing to um, you know, have the difficulty of going through the entire stack for everything, every behavior you want to test. Uh, we avoid fake web, we use fake web for a while, but maintaining these strings of net HTTP, or sorry, just HTTP responses became cumbersome, so we really like artifice when possible, uh, or this sort of just vanilla test level strategy and supplement that with the full stack tests. So the last problem is, okay, now we've fixed, uh, fixed it so that if there's a bug or test fail, that's, that's really good. Uh, it just prevents a bunch of bugs. But now the tests are pain in the ass to run. So, uh, you know, it might take a long time. That's usually the biggest complaint. This is, interestingly, this is a complaint of monolithic applications and also a complaint of service-oriented architectures. <laughs> it appears that tests always just take forever. So I want to uh, introduce uh, this concept of the testing pyramid. I didn't come up with this. It's been written, around, uh, written about by a lot of people, but I think it's a really important thing that often gets overlooked, especially when it comes to Ruby testing, especially in the era of uh, Cucumber and these other high-level testing tools like WebRat. Um, so the idea of the testing pyramid is it's kind of like the food pyramid. Uh, the things at the bottom you want to have a lot of, and then as you go further up the pyramid, you want to have less and less of this. But you kind of need a little bit of everything in order to really have a balanced diet. So the bottom is, is unit tests. Uh, they, they run really fast. They tell you that your objects are doing the right thing. Above that, you have integration tests. They test clusters of objects. And then higher up, you've got GUI tests. Those might run the browser. They might not run the browser. Um, but think about, you know, can you uh, have maybe 100 unit tests for every 10 integration tests and for every single user interface test? Uh, so those 111 tests will run much faster than if you had 100 UI tests. But then you can try to get the same level of confidence in your code by layering these strategies together in a more strategic way. So I would caution everyone against inverting the testing pyramid, either, whether you're a monolithic app or a service or an architecture. If you're writing tons of cucumber tests and you're not writing unit tests because it just doesn't seem natural, you are headed for pain. Uh, and come talk to me there. <laughs> So the, the underlying concept here is continuous improvement. 
Uh, I really credit continuous improvement with our ability to work out the kinks in our evolution of uh, applying a service-oriented architecture. I don't think we could have been able to do it without, uh, without this approach. Uh, we do a lot of root cause analysis. Anytime in breaks in production, we stop everything right after stand up. We might have a 30-minute you know, discussion trying to peel back the layers of the onion. Uh, what went wrong here? How can we change our processes and tools to better address that next time? And one term we use a lot in those conversations is proportional investment. So just because something went wrong once doesn't mean you should go spend the next you know, three days carrying on the, the ultimate solution. We didn't spend uh, two days uh, or even a full day working out the first iteration of the CLI that allows us to boot the app. What we did was we created a very basic version which, which worked once or twice. Uh, and then we said, well, as a team, anytime our designer runs E2O start and it doesn't start, we're going to invest an hour at that time. So in the beginning, we did that pretty frequently. Uh, over time, it became less and less frequent. It might be something even more esoteric that would cause it to fail. We would fix those bugs uh, as they came in rather than trying to solve them off front. So it was a proportional investment based on the, the frequency of the problem and the severity of the problem. The problem might only occur once, but it's a really big deal and it happened in production. It might be worth investing a few days in resolving it, but try to be proportional. Uh, the other concept that we try to apply is that development is like production. Don't let your development tools slack. By development, I'm also including testing. Uh, a lot of people are tweaking their production environment uh, a whole lot, but try to apply the same rigor to development so that it's gradually getting better and not a big step function. We're just going to wait until everything's so terrible. Uh, you know, the tests are taking now. 20 minutes and nobody can get anything done before you make your first attempt at trying to speed them up. Try to start speeding up when it goes above 30 seconds because it's on its way to being 20 minutes uh, and it's easier to make progress in, in small increments. So our key takeaways uh, related to applying service-oriented design to our architecture. Uh, first off, there's many hidden costs. Uh, none of the things that I described, the solutions that we implemented, were things that we planned on uh, when we were looking at sort of how we're going to lay out the systems. They can be okay, but it's something that uh, it's not necessarily obvious when you're looking at making these decisions. Uh, on the other hand, it can still be worth it. We're pretty happy with the way the calculator service has worked uh, and our weather service has worked, and that's why we maintain them like that today. We haven't had to make many changes to weather service because it changes, that it, uh, it changes to a half a different rate of change, and it has allowed us to insulate a whole portion of our architecture and not worry about it while we're making fast changes to other areas of the stack. Uh, like everything else, service-oriented design is, uh, can, be, can be very good, but moderation is key. Don't you know, lay out your entire application in terms of how many services can be used to solve this problem. That's probably the wrong way to look at it. You'll end up with way too many services. You'll be heading down the, uh, <laughs> skiing down that curve that I showed at the beginning of the talk, and we'll uh, you know, uh, get to the other side as quickly as possible to the key. Uh, finally, address frictions as they occur. Uh, don't let little problems build up. Iterate with your team on your process and how you can solve problems. Your mileage may vary. I know teams that have no services. Uh, actually, Etsy is an interesting example of this. They, they try to avoid services because they decided that the, the costs associated with them are not worth it. Instead, they invest a lot in making maintenance of their monolithic architecture uh, a lot easier. So they've gone one way. I've also seen teams that have a lot more services and are able to deal with that uh, you know, very well. So it's different for every team. Just try to keep a close eye on what's working best for your team. Thank you.